to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and the people of Israel brought back a bad report to Moses, and they said this, We were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in theirs also. Numbers chapter 13, verse 32 and 33. We welcome you today to our study of the Old Testament books as we're thinking about the lessons, practical lessons today, from the book of Numbers. And so we want to encourage you, if you haven't already got your Bible out, please locate it and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study together today. These lessons are being brought to you today by members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question or you'd like to study more on any subject, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. You'll find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who are concerned about lost souls, and who are friendly to anyone who comes into their assembly. Friend, we also want you to know that at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you as well in your journey to know God and study His Word. Please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got a wide variety of good Bible study material there. We've got videos and audios as well as study questions and transcripts, written material, just a whole host of good Bible study material. And the great part about it is it's all free. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on video or audio, We'll be happy to send that to you free. You can download it from our website free, or we can send you a hard copy as well free. Fill out a media request form on our website, or you can write to us or call us at the end of the program, and we'll be happy to help you with that in any way that we can. Also, as smartphones are getting more popular in this day and age, don't forget about our app that is available in both the Google Play Store and the App Store. The Gospel of Christ app is how you find it, and it has there a wide variety of good Bible study material that can help you in your study of the Word of God on the go as well. And so we encourage you to check those out in any way that we can help you in your study of the Word of God. Today we're thinking about the wonderful book of Numbers, the uh, following of God's people's journey toward the promised land, but it kind of hit a speed bump in the book of Exodus with their complaining and murmuring, and now in the book of Numbers, it's going to hit a very large speed bump along the way to the promised land. The key word here in the book of Numbers is the word sojourn or wanderings. You've got the numbering of God's people, which is uh, all the men are 603,550. We have the total number put together there of the men, 20 years uh, of age and above. But more than just the numbering of it, you've got the wandering and the sojourning of God's people. And really, they're kind of wandering around in sin because they wouldn't trust God and continue to follow Him. They kept complaining and murmuring, and God let all those people who didn't have faith uh, pass away in the wilderness of sin. Of course, the key verse, as we began with, uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse 32 and 33, kind of is a summary statement of what's going on in Numbers. Uh, they go spy out the land. Moses sends out spies. They go spy out the land. And yeah, it's just like God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's beautiful and more uh, promising than we ever imagined. But there's a problem. The giants are there, the descendants of Anak. And 10 of the 12 spies bring out back a bad report and they say, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. Surely that we were in theirs. We were like a bug that was ready to be stomped, kind of in these people's sight. Now the problem was they forgot all that God had already done. And their lack of faith is what will ultimately lead to many of them dying in the wilderness. And so the key phrase will be mentioned by God 13 times in the book of Numbers, because you believe me not. 
wasn't that they didn't believe in God. They knew there was a God, but they didn't act in faith and fully trust God even in the face of their enemies. And so those are some of the main ideas that we're going to find uh, in the book of Numbers. Now when you think about, okay, what's Numbers about and how does that help a person? Friend, we learn this. And this would be the practical application from Numbers. The main one is a lack of faith, or as the Bible referred to it, unbelief kept God's people from entering the promised land. And friend, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, will play off of uh, the people's lack of faith in this time, in the time of Israel, and the Hebrew writer will say, that's still the case today. A lack of trust and a lack of active faith in God is still going to keep people out of the promised land. No, we're not talking about on the other side of the Jordan. We're talking about heaven itself. I've got to have the faith to trust God when everybody looks bigger, when my problems mount up, when temptation and challenges arise. That's when my faith is tested. And do I have the trust and the faith in God during those times? When it's easy, hey, everybody can do it. Do I have the faith during those times? to really know and to live by God's principles when the going gets tough. And that's one of the powerful lessons that we'll learn from the book of Numbers. Unbelief, beware, beware of unbelief. It brings a multitude of problems. Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13, the Hebrew writer will say, Beware, brethren. Based on that principle, he'll say to Christians, Beware, brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Don't let your faith cause you, lack of faith cause you, to give up on God just as many did in the book of Numbers. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 will say, Take heed, beware, watch out, lest you fall. And many of those people were destroyed because of their lack of faith in Almighty God. And so when you think about the book of Numbers, Really, the book can be broken down very simply. Uh, chapters 1 through 10, they are preparing uh, to go into Canaan. They're at Sinai, and they are now preparing to go into the Canaan land. God's ready to give them that Canaan land of rest. Then they go from Sinai to Moab, to the region of Moab, and they've got the wanderings because they wouldn't. God's ready to give it to them, but they wouldn't trust God fully. So chapters 11 through 21, you've got God's people wandering in the desert as it were and multiplicity of them dying. And then chapters 22 through 36, we go from the area of Moab right up to Canaan's border. Now that old generation has passed. They're now prepared to fully trust God, hopefully, and they will go into the book of, uh, they will go into Canaan in the book of Joshua as we're going to see. Now, as we think about Israel's history, and as we study the book of Numbers, we want to make it practical for me and for you, a Christian today. What does the Old Testament book of Numbers, talking to the Israelites about entering the physical land of Canaan, have anything to do with me and you today? That's what we want to glean from this book, and there's a multiplicity of lessons that are very powerful and very clear uh, from this book. And so here are some of the living messages from the book of Numbers. Number one, we learn that God's people need to make a commitment to be separate from the world. Look in Numbers chapter 6, and I want you to see the separation that God's people should have so that they can really serve God and trust Him in every way. Number 6 has the law of separation, or the Nazarite. Verse 1 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine, similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. He'll not have any grape juice or grapes or raisins all the days of separate. And he goes on to tell everything, not to cut his head, all, not to shave, all these things. We think, okay, Nazarite vow. That was interesting then. Again, what's that got to do with us? Friend, as Christians, are we not to be consecrated, sanctified, and separate from the world? This, this person here who took this Nazarite vow was to look and to act and to think and to dress and to be in every way 
separate, different, stand out. Friend, we're God's own special people today. According to Titus 2, verses 11 through 13, we are to be consecrated and holy, which carries the idea of being separate and sanctified. And then listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. God says to His people, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. I will be your God, you shall be my people. Christians are to live a life that is not like the world. I'm not saying that we can't have things that people in the world have, but we're to be different, unique, to, to stand out in a good way because of our morals, because of our speech, because of our devotion and commitment to Christ, because of the way we live and act and talk and dress. We're not living like people in the world who are doing things that are not right. We should stand out for good. We should be separated for the good things that we do. And people ought to see that and it ought to draw us, draw them to Christianity and draw us naturally closer to God. Here is such a powerful lesson from the book of Numbers and it's probably one of the major messages. And it's this, complaining will always, always bring peril and cause problems with others, but mainly with my relationship with God. I want you to look in Numbers chapter 11 and I want you to see their complaining here and the problems it created. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord for the Lord heard it and His anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them in the outskirts of the camp. Now we turn over to Numbers chapter 14 and that same old song, complaining, is still going on. Look in Numbers 14, verse number 1. The Bible says this, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said, listen to what they said, If only... We had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Now, what led to their complaining? It was the bad report of the ten leaders. Those twelve spies, except for uh, Caleb, uh, and except for Joshua and Caleb, who said, hey, let's go in and do it. God said we can. The other ten, the majority, who should have been looked at as leaders and were, they said, we're just like grasshoppers. There's no way we can go in there and take the land of Canaan. And the people wept all night and they complained against Moses and Aaron and ultimately against God. Why didn't you just leave us to die in Egypt? Why didn't we die in the wilderness? And so again, we see that complaining never, never helps. The Bible says this in Philippians 2 verses 13 through 15. The Bible says, do all things without murmuring and complaining. You ever know anybody that no matter what happened, or no matter how good it may be, can find something to gripe about, can find something to grumble and complain about. Do you like being around people like that? Complainers and murmurers and grumblers and gripers. How do you like people like that? My friend, nobody wants to be around that. Somebody who's griping or complaining or murmuring all the time. Who wants to be around that all the time? And it suggests a lack of faith, ultimately, a lack of faith in God. I need to learn to be content. Doesn't the Bible teach that I need to be, learn to be content with such things as I have? 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10. Doesn't the Bible teach God will provide all our needs? Philippians 4, 19. Matthew 6, verse 21 through 33. Complaining and murmuring and griping all the time. Really, who is that against? Well, ultimately, if God said He's going to take care of us, and God's promised we'll have what we need, ultimately, isn't that against God? And friend, it was that sin that would ultimately lead to the downfall and demise of a big number of those people. And friend, I wonder if complaining and murmuring, murmuring and, and griping and a spirit of bitterness and grouchiness, if that won't cause a lot of people to be lost on the Day of Judgment. That's something God was tired of then, and I'm sure God gets just as tired of when people do that today. 
And then, of course, another practical lesson that we learn from the book of Numbers is we need to do our best to not have the grasshopper complex. Now you say, what in the world is the grasshopper complex? Well, that's what the people had in Numbers 13, right? You remember, they went into the land of Canaan, and boy, it was just like God said. It was a beautiful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came back and they said, it's just like God said. It's everything we've ever dreamed of, but there's one problem. You remember the people of Anak, the giants that were in the land? Well, they lived there, and we look like grasshoppers in our own time. Surely we did in theirs. There's no way we can go over and take that land. They had the grasshopper complex. Everybody's more powerful. Everybody's bigger. And our enemies and our problems and their weapons and their size, we're just little old bitty grasshoppers, and there's no way we can go over and overtake that. Now, they had forgot that the locusts consumed Egypt, didn't they? And that a little bitty old grasshopper combined together could do a whole lot. Well, they'd forgot that lesson, but more importantly, they had forgot who was on their side. Friend, when we get the grasshopper complex, when we think everybody and every problem and every sin and every wickedness and every temptation is so much bigger and so much more powerful than us, you know what we've left out? We've left out God. With God on our side, we can do anything. The grasshopper complex takes God out of the equation. And friend, remember the words of Philippians 4.13. When I, when I think, okay, man, there's no way I can do this. This problem is too big. This difficulty is too challenging. Uh, we just can't defeat this enemy. Let's remember these words. Philippians 4.13, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I wonder sometimes if we're, our mindset is not our own worst enemy. I wonder sometimes how many times things never get off the ground and things never get going in the direction they ought to because we defeat ourselves before we even start. We say, we, there's no way we can do that. We can't accomplish this goal. We don't have enough time, money, effort, energy, whatever it may be. And before we ever get started, the old grasshopper complex comes into play. Let's realize again, God, with God on our side, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with God. Luke chapter 1 says, and as Christians, we need to have that mentality. Now, here's the opposite of the grasshopper complex. Caleb is an example of someone who you would think at his age, older in life, 80 plus years, at his age, there's no way he's going to do this. And yet Caleb illustrates so beautifully what it means to have true faith in God. One of the two good spies, Joshua and Caleb, Caleb says, you know what? God promised it to me. At my age, I want you still to give me that mountain. I'm going to take it. Look in Numbers chapter 13. Look at what uh, Caleb says in verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. And then look what Caleb says in Numbers 14, verse 24. God said of Caleb, But my servant Caleb, he's different. He has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully. I will bring him into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. And as you read the book of Joshua, Caleb was promised a great piece of land. That land has a big mountain on it, and that land has a lot of enemies on it. And Caleb, old in life, says, so what? Give me that mountain. Caleb said, we can go in and take it. God said, you need to listen to Caleb. He's different than the rest of you. And Caleb put his faith in God. He didn't let any mountain or any enemy or any people stand in the way. He went in, put faith in God, went in and did what God said, and look at the great things that both he and Joshua were able to do. And so there's a powerful lesson. We need more people like Caleb who will faithfully follow God in every way. Now the next scene that we see in the book of Numbers is a rather sad scene. And that's the scene where Moses is ultimately going to have to pay the price because of his own anger caused by the people of God. I want you to look in Numbers chapter 20. And notice what happens because of Moses' sin at Kadesh Barnea. Numbers chapter 20, verse number 11, the Bible says, 
Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Sounds all good and well until verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow or reverence me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. And as you close the book of Numbers, here Moses stands on Mount Nebo looking into Canaan, never setting one foot in there. Why? The people complained and murmured. Uh, they said to Moses, why didn't you just leave us there to die? We could have died by the flesh pots back in Egypt. You've brought us out here to kill us. Moses got tired of that, as anybody would have. And when God said to Moses, when the people are complaining again about where we're going to get water, I want you to speak to the rock. Well, you can imagine Moses is fed up, and Moses hits the rock. That wasn't what God said. And there were consequences because of that. The peop Moses' anger got the best of him. And no doubt we might have been angry too. But friend, we learn another powerful lesson. God, when God tells us how to do something, God doesn't want us to take the back route. God wants to do it exactly like He said. When God told Moses, speak to the rock, and when Moses took that staff and hit that rock, everybody saw that. And God said to Moses and Aaron, no, I told you to speak to it. You didn't obey me. You're not taking these people in. And of course, it's Joshua who will ultimately do that. Now, as we think about lessons that continue to help us understand more about God from the book of Numbers, a friend, we also learn a very powerful lesson about God's Word, which had been spoken to the people throughout, and the complete and full nature of God's Word to Israel then and to us today. I want you to look in Numbers chapter 22, Verse number 18. What do we learn about the Word of God? Look in Numbers 22, 18, and the Bible says, Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do more or to do less. Now, turn over to chapter 23, and I want you to hear what's said in verses 19 and 20. Numbers 23, verses 19 and 20. God says, or the Word of God says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has God said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reserve it. And so basically what you've got going on here is one of the enemies of God, Balak, is trying now to hire a prophet of God to curse Israel. And Balaam, although not one of the best characters in the Bible himself, says to Balak, I cannot do more than God says. Whatever God says, that's the way it's going to be. And then he goes on to say, if God blesses, that'll be the way it is. If God curses, that's the way it is. Nobody's going to reverse what God says. Friend, here we learn about the complete, full nature of the word out of God's mouth. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that word we have. In the Bible today, all Scripture is breathed out by God, inspired of God, and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friend, it is the Word of God that's the perfect law of liberty today. James chapter 1, verse 25, it is the Word of God that will save, Romans 1, 16. It is the Word of God that pierces to the division of heart and soul, uh, Hebrews 4, verse 12. And it is that Word by which we obey the gospel, 1 Peter 1, verses 22 through 25, and by which we're born again. And so just like Balaam, we need to realize what matters is what God and His Word says. And friend, a final lesson that we learn from the book of Numbers is the inescapable consequences of sin if not dealt with the right way. Look in Numbers chapter 32. And I want you to see what God says to the people about their sin and their inability to escape that on their own. God's talking to them about doing right, following His will, and then He tells them what's going to happen if they don't. Numbers 32, 23. But if you do not do so, if you don't listen to me and do what I say, if you do not do so, 
Then take note. Write it down, God says. You have sinned against the Lord. And listen to this. And be sure your sins will find you out. Friend, can you, can you run away from sin? Well, let's think about an Old Testament man who tried. He got up, he got on a boat, and he went as far away as he could. Where did he find himself? Well, Jonah eventually finds himself in the bottom of the ocean in the belly of a great fish, vomited up on the sea, and then he finally said, hmm, I better do what God says. You can't run from God. Your sin will find, you can't run from it, you can't push it under the rug, you can't put it and bury it in a hole really deep. Sin will always find you out. Why? Because God's all-knowing. Nothing. We can't hide it from God. Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are open and naked before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. And, friend, let's realize, although we may try to run from it, try to hide it, try to escape it, the only way to deal with sin is to let God deal with it according to His will. All of us have sin in our life if we're of unaccountable age. Romans 3, verse 23. And God tells us how to deal with sin. Romans 6, 17 says this. God be thanked, though you were the slaves of sin. Listen now. Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and you've been set free from sin. How do you get set free from sin? By obeying the form of doctrine found in the New Testament. What does that mean? Well, friend, we've got to believe in Jesus. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. I've got to turn from sin and repent. Acts 3, 19, Peter preached, repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out. I must acknowledge, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And to have my sins washed away, to be forgiven, I must be immersed in water. Here's what the Bible says. Peter said in the first gospel sermon, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Baptism does now also save us. 1 Peter 3.21 And then we want to be encouraged to continue to have faith in God so just like the people of Israel, one day we can enter that wonderful promised land. May God help each of us to live in such a way that we can live faithfully with Him forever in that wonderful place called heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.